everyone. Welcome back to Mind Pump. In the first half of this show, we talk about the benefits of training like a power lifter, even for non-power lifting exercises such as pull-ups, rows, and dips. You'll be surprised just how strong you can get. After that, we talk about a variety of other fun and interesting topics you'll want to stick around for. In the second half of the show, the guys coach four live callers on questions such as I keep hurting myself. How can I stop the madness? I'm getting stronger, but I'm not building muscle. Am I not eating enough calories? Please tell me what I'm doing wrong so I can build some mass. Finally, as a reminder, we have another channel. It's called Mind Pump Clips. If you haven't subscribed already, go over there, subscribe. It's great. There's short clips from the show that are easy to watch and to share. All right, enjoy the show. Here's a hack that'll pack muscle on your body. Do powerlifting techniques on non-powerlifting exercises. For example, heavy singles, doubles, and triples for things like pull-ups, dips, and other compound lifts that are not traditional powerlifting exercises. Uh, I did that today in my workout. Always reminds me there's so much value mm. when you apply what powerlifters do to you know the traditional lifts, the bench, squat, and deadlift to non-traditional powerlifting exercises. Uh, you really get some great gains from it. Yeah, I think not a lot of people uh, think to to apply that towards, especially like a dip or a pull up, and, and add load. Like most time, I mean, it just it seems more conducive to to add a bunch of reps uh, to those type of body weight exercises. But there are ways to load your body substantially and get the strength benefits from those. Totally. Well. So yeah, you, like when you define like powerlifting technique, it's like uh, maybe multiple sets, non failure, uh, low reps, long rest periods, right? So like yeah. typically you'd see with a deadlift, they'll do like one rep or two reps, rest for three minutes, do it again. And it, it's sub-maximal, so they're not maxing out. They're essentially practicing a heavy lift and it builds tremendous strength, right? Really gives you that 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 strength that you could get with that one or two reps. Um, and this is how their power lifters are able to get such max lifts. But you do this with like a pull-up, like I did today. I, I strapped some weight around my waist and I just did a bunch of sets of like two and three reps. Yeah. And my strength goes to the roof. My my ability to do pull ups goes to the roof too. I could do more reps with body weight from gaining strength with that. Uh, but also, it just uh, it just feels really good. And I get that the muscle building effects. But most people, like I said, don't they don't apply those techniques to any other exercise aside from like the traditional you know powerlifting uh, lifts. I didn't train this way for years because <clears throat> I didn't identify as a as a powerlifter at all. In fact, I was I felt I was the opposite. Right when you kind of fall into the the bodybuilding category. You tend to like look at power lifters like, oh, I don't, well, there's no reason for me to lift like yeah. that or to train that way. I don't want to look that yeah, way. You don't think you want your body to look like that. Yeah. You have no, you, you, you look to towards that and you go like, and that's not to, a knock that all power lifters don't look good. It's just that you, you, you look to your space, which was bodybuilding. You're like, that's the physique I want. Therefore yep. I train this way. And I just. I was missing out on so so many benefits from that. It wasn't until much later in my career did I start to uh, to take advantage of that tip. And I saw he, and I would add to that um like explosive Olympic lifts. Oh, so good, yeah. Right? So like um man, my mm. traps and my shoulders blew up when I started doing these like hang clean to like push presses. Yeah. You know, which is like a traditional kind of like Olympic type of movement. And I would load it to where it was like really heavy. I wouldn't go max to where I was maxing out, but I would make the load hard to where I could two to three reps would be challenging for me. Oh, that that explosive movement on a lift like that, that I'd never trained that way. And I, I saw huge. What a great point, because that. you could do uh, you could take and borrow uh, Olympic skills and techniques or principles and apply them to non Olympic lifts, right? Like uh, uh, a snatch is a very technical exercise. It takes a long time to learn how to do it, right? Uh, clean and press, right? It takes a long time to learn it to, to learn how to do it. So let's say you want to take advantage of the explosiveness, but you don't necessarily want to, you know, practice this lift for six months to perfect the technique because it takes a long time to get good at it before you can add load and all that stuff. Well, you could do like a high pull. Yeah. Like a high pull. Minimize is a, your risk. That's it. It's a low skill you know, exercise in comparison that you can do explosively. Uh, kettlebell swing. Yeah. It's a lower skill explosive movement. You could do a, a push press, which is also a mm -hmm. lower skill explosive movement, but gain the the benefits of that explosive, uh, you know, lift that Olympic lifters tend well, to Well, this do. is also where I like to add bands on the other yeah. side of the bar. And so that way you could really work on the acceleration okay. of it, but it's, 
it, it gives you that tension up at the very top. So it's like you can get through the movement quickly and then still get the benefit of, uh, you know, that same kind of um, feel that you would from just moving the weight quickly, like an Olympic lift. Yeah. Oh, so, so you know, it's funny when I think about, cause you, you said how we get in our camps. I think that's just human nature. And what, what happens is we get so stuck in our, I don't know, our box that we forget that there's wisdom or, things that we can learn and apply to ourselves from other camps. So we look at Olympic lifters, like I don't want to do any Olympic lifting. I don't want to compete in the Olympics or train in that way. So we ignore everything they do, or I don't want to do powerlifting or I don't want to do bodybuilding or, you know, kettlebells or mace bells or whatever. And so we just, we don't look to them for anything that we can apply to ourselves. This reminds me of, so as a kid, I did martial arts as a kid and then I stopped and I got older and I did martial arts again. But when I was a kid, I was really into it and I bought books on martial arts. I had this one book that was like martial arts from around the world. And it would talk about uh, like Savat, which was like this, this French kickboxing uh, type of kickboxing and then Muay Thai and catch wrestling, which is the submission wrestling from North America. And I, and I would read about all these different skills. And I was always thinking as a kid, boy, I wonder who would win mm -hmm. in a fight, this guy versus that guy versus this or whatever. And then the UFC came out and it was this new type of competition where they actually had people fight against each other with different styles. And what happened is it put on the forefront exactly what I'm talking about. It, it stopped becoming which style is the best. And it became more about well, what's good from each style yeah. that I could borrow to make myself a better fighter. And if you look at MMA now, it's actually become its own style of martial art and it's borrowed the best mm -hmm. from multiple disciplines. In fact, MMA is so open-minded that you'll see a fighter throw a, a technique that's from some other martial yeah. art. You've and seen then, a front kick knock somebody out. Yeah, and then other fighters are like, oh, that works. They don't yeah. care where it comes from. Right. Let me apply that to my style. We could do that with exercise and strength training. We could totally do that. So it's like, don't be so closed-minded because power lifters, there's a lot we can learn from them. Bodybuilders, there's a lot we can learn from them. There's a lot we can learn from Olympic I feel like lifters. that's just a good philosophy in life to live. By. Totally. Yeah. 100%. I, I, you see the same thing in, in business, right? You, you see, uh, you see that people identify with a type of leadership or a type of way of scaling. And then they're like, this is the way to do it. And it's like, man, there's so many different ways to skin a cat. And I feel like there's something to learn from so many different people and how they do things, especially. And I feel like the more, uh, the, the stronger I feel about that, the more I want to investigate that, right? The mm, more yeah. I go like- Why is this successful? Right, right. Like the more, like I, I catch myself if I like, for example, I, I see somebody who's like really successful and I don't like how they did. It's just like, they're different than me. I don't like- Yeah, something the, about them you don't like. Yeah, something about them I don't like is their personality. And like, I, I feel like turned off by them. Like I, I challenge myself to investigate that. Like instead of me going like, oh, I don't like him and forget- the dude's unbelievably successful. He did something right. There's something that he's doing that I should be able to extract and then utilize for my own success. And I think is it's human nature for us to to repel stuff like that. If it's not in your camp or you don't identify with it, then we immediately reject it as all bad or oh, I don't want to do it. It's like ah, that's to me. That's there's got to be some gold in there. And if I if I feel that way, I need to go towards it and try and learn about it and see what I can Look, extract full, from full it. Full transparency. Uh, when we started Mind Pump, there was a lot we hated in the fitness industry. There's a lot we still hate in the fitness industry. Just the way that you know they could prey on insecurities and the lies and the false promises and the focusing on the things that really don't make a big difference, ignoring the stuff that makes big differences, making feel people feel bad about themselves. That's how you sell to them all that stuff. However, there are nuggets of wisdom in how effective they are at reaching people mm -hmm. or getting people's attention. So full transparency, this is a conversation that we had often when we first started Mind Pump. We said, okay, we want to, we want, we have the right message, we think, but we're gotta, we got to compete with these people who are doing a damn good job of getting people's attention. So how can we utilize what they're doing, but do it in a way to where we can convey the right message so we can learn from them, but mm -hmm. do it the right way. And that's, a lot of what we try to do on the show. So we see people who who sell crappy products or get people's attention on social media. And yeah, at first we're like, oh, that moron, that idiot, whatever. So like, oh, well, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. This person's getting tons of views. They're getting lots of attention. If we want to beat them, we got to get attention yeah. too. 
what can we learn from this person and do it in our own, you know, is there a way to do it with integrity? You know, and I think we just kind of look through the landscape of what's been working, what people respond to, because at the end of the day, you want to be able to connect with your average person and like their habits and, you know, where they're drawn to. Otherwise, you're never going to like present them with good information because they're not going to be receptive to it. So um, I can have all the best information possible uh, and not connect with that person. I'm not. I'm not winning. Like we're not, we're not getting anywhere. So like it, we, a lot of times got to step back out of our, uh, a high horse and, and be like, okay, well, what, what, what is your average person? What are they even interested in? And like, how can we present it in a similar way, but like now add in maybe some, some truth in there. Sell, sell the right idea better than they can sell the wrong idea. All right. The free program giveaway today is maps power lift. This is a power lifting workout program. Here's how you can win. You have to leave a comment under this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it here on YouTube. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. And if you win, we'll notify you in the comment section. That's the only way we'll notify you. Okay, so there, there, there's some scammers out there. We will only notify you in the comment section if you want free access to MAPS Powerlift. We also have a sale going on right now. MAPS OCR, 50% off. And MAPS Cardio, 50% off. You can find them both by clicking on the link at the top of the description below to get the discount and to get set up. All right, here comes the show. Yeah. You know, not to go in a dark uh, direction, but <laughs> the, uh, it is human nature to, to want to fall into a tribe or a camp. Mm -hmm. It is easy to manipulate human nature to make you hate other people or hate people who think differently than you or a little differently than you and then just generalize it and say, they're all bad, we're all good. And then take that and then manipulate people into doing what you want. And this is what marketers do, but even more so, this is what politics does. I, you know, it's so yeah. funny you bring this up because I, I was just reading this. Uh, I think it's on Warren Buffett quotes. Is this page that I follow, and uh, I thought this was a really interesting point that was made. And it was, and I thought I had heard this before. Um, maybe not put together the same way that this the, this person posted this, but it was like, if you put a, a hundred black ants and a hundred red ants in a jar, what would happen? Uh, and nothing would happen. They would actually live live uh, harmoniously together and be fine. Like you could totally do that and be okay. But if you actually shook the jar up with them in there, the red ants and black ants would start attacking each other. And the black ants would think it's the red ants that are attacking them. And the red ants would think it's the black ants and they would actually end up eating themselves. Uh, because the jar was shook, and I feel like not realizing that it's it has not, the hand that it's shook the person the jar. shaking it. That's the problem, right? Yes. I thought that was such a great metaphor for mm -hmm. what we see in our society right now. It's like I, I see what's going on with Kyrie Irving. We saw what just happened with Kanye West, and it's like the everybody quickly s separates in two sides. Like we have to choose. Like it's mm -hmm. like I'm either defending Kyrie or Kanye, or I'm on the other side of calling him a yeah. racist. Like I can't actually be in the middle and be like maybe he's not a bad guy and maybe he didn't mean this or maybe maybe it's not like it's meant to be interpreted this way and and i can't be objective about it i have to decide i need to choose because we all hate each other and it's so crazy how quickly we we don't realize that somebody is shaking our jar up oh yeah and, and maybe it's not that person it's that selective we, outrage is what it is like uh, okay so you're going to be mad at this person for posting a movie that has anti-Semitic, uh, you know, uh, I guess themes in it or whatever. But, and this is the NBA, right? NBA is all, oh, we hate this guy, whatever. NBA does business, lots of business with a communist country that literally takes a group of people because of their beliefs and puts them in internment camps. This is a fact, but they quiet and silent about it. And, and players are not allowed to talk about it. They'll get in big trouble. Right. It's selective outrage. What they're doing and what they try to do is they manipulate us by dividing us and finding ways to divide us and pushing that button and hammering that button. Now, why is that such a manipulative, effective manipulative tactic? Because they'll come out and say, this is the enemy. These people are evil. And then they'll come out and say, I'm the one that'll save you. Mm -hmm. Vote for me or buy my shit or do what I tell you because I'm on your side. They have to do this, by the way. They have to absolute have to do this in order to manipulate you into agreeing with everything that they do. You ever notice this? Like people who are hardcore uh, political, there's not a single thing they disagree with on their side. They can't be objective and say, well, yeah, I like this stuff, but I don't like this policy. Or right. I don't like what they, no, no, no. They defend everything. It's like, yeah. they've been so hard manipulated that nobody can remain and be objective. Yeah. Uh, so it's. Or you can't do like um, policy by policy. 
You know, That's right. You can't you can't just like take one issue at a time and have an opinion that's maybe different than the complete uh, list of of okay. if I'm in this camp, I have to subscribe to all of these ideas, right? And and you know now all of a sudden our, our democracy is the, the part gonna that I, die otherwise. The part that I find comical about that that statement that is very true is that if you, all you have to do is go back about 40, 50 years and both sides were touting different shit. That's, yeah. like, that's the part yeah. that's supposed to well, You're like so staunch about your team. You're like, yeah, yeah this, 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 this. I stand by that. It's Bro, like, really? How your far team, back are you going to go Just here. like 40, 50 yeah. years ago, your team was on the other side Bro, of this. Yeah. The, <laughs> what, what part of history are we going to focus hey, on? Yeah. That's really what it's about. That's a fact. The Democrats were the KKK. Yeah. They yeah. were the Jim Crow laws. They were the pro-segregation. Yeah, yeah. So, and I'm fact. not saying that's what they are now. Well, and look what's happening with war right now. I think it's really interesting what's happening with war. Conservatives tend to be like the war hawks on, uh, yeah. for, for so many years, and now you're starting now to- the opposite. Yeah. Well, what it is is whoever's in power- the other side will counter them regardless. So let's say that the, let's say right now the, that the, the Democrats who technically are in power were like, we're not going to war. Then you would see the right say, no, 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 we need to go to war. So mm -hmm. really what's the game is, is so to counter. To undermine. You're yeah. always keeping yeah. everybody. By the set. way, meanwhile, they're both having tea together behind closed doors and in, uh, in and out together. Oh, both. Uh, if both. you look at their actions, it's so funny. I'd say, you know, we did, we talked, I don't know if we talked about this on the show, but uh, it was, who were we talking to that was saying that maybe the best depiction of how shit really gets down is the house of cards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that. That's that was so, ac I bet you, I mean, that is, I mean, obviously it's a dramatization, but yeah. that's kind of what happens. I remember, I remember when Bush uh, was, when after September 11th, they passed the Patriot Act, uh, NDAA, non uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, which basically within it says that they can take an American citizen, throw them in jail indefinitely with no due process, which is scary. Yeah or that they could assassinate someone with no due process, right? They could spy on people, no due. And so there were people who were pissed off about this. One of the people that railed against it was Senator Barack Obama. He did speeches as a senator, it was like against the Patriot Act, against all these liberty destroying, freedom destroying uh, policies. Well, then he wins and I voted for him, right? He wins. Yeah. What does he do? Yep. Strengthens it, adds to it, extends it, right? Um, now that's not the only example, right? They both that's they both a tend crazy to, amount to it. They both tend to do this. Both sides tend to do this. Uh, you see them work together very strongly. By the way, when another party that's outside their two parties starts to rise up, then you'll see them work together very strongly to shut them out. I used this example a long time ago, but I haven't said it in a long time. Pepsi and Coke did this in the eighties. Yeah. yeah. Pep in the eighties, there was this advertising campaign. They called the Pepsi and Coke wars. Yeah, the co the cola wars. The cola wars, yeah. And the commercials were, you know, take the Pepsi challenge or which better, Coke or Pepsi. It was so brilliant. Who do you know who the the, the brilliant mind behind that? Well, who that Coke was? and Pepsi? No, 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 no. Like <laughs> that's oh. a brand. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. who is this the oh, CEO or who is the marketing? Yeah, which one reached out who's to the, the yeah, other side? Who's the marketing genius that said, "Oh my God, I have a brilliant idea. Let's play the political game for consumerism and let's actually right. pretend like we're fighting each other." So all eyes are on us and we just crush Bro, the com I feel like Coke competition was first right and so like pepsi's always been at their heels trying to get like market share uh so i would think that the pepsi probably pitched it to that literally people don't realize that they knew about it they were cool with it there were no lawsuits they fought each other and what they did is they both took shares away from it's a brilliant, all the other soda it's companies. a brilliant yeah. it would be like RC us Cola, okay it would be like us partnering up with beach body and creating a program together and then talking shit about each other like and spending crazy money attacking each other in the media. And creating the illusion that there's only two yeah, choices. Right. And then, oh, you want to work out? Yeah. Which one are you going to pick? Yeah. This yeah, one yeah. or that one? Yeah. Everybody else loses. Yeah, yeah. We end up winning. <laughs> Meanwhile, behind closed doors, we're, we're over here celebrating. It's together. a yeah. crazy game. Speak, speaking of which. My hip hop country uh, <laughs> the, the <laughs> workouts that I've been no, working it's, on it's you guys. Hip -hop, it's urban hip hop. Uh, uh, cowboy, uh, cowboy well, class. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my bad. Uh, okay. Speaking of which, aren't they? Wasn't there a uh, who was it? Was it senator or someone that was trying to pass legislation to ban TikTok? Yeah, the FCC is. That's oh, yeah. okay. So, well, okay, I want to hear what your thoughts on this because I, I have some thoughts. I, I, your thoughts are probably more political. Mine's yeah. more business. So yeah. I want to hear. I want to hear your political take on this, and then I'm going to tell you my business strategy and thought around this. Yeah, I um, I think it's I, I think it's smart because uh, TikTok is owned by the Communist Party of China. Um, and so it's just a, it's a really wide open tool that they can utilize to either manipulate um, people's attention or manipulate ideas, push their own ideas, or even just track people and do what they want. Not saying it wouldn't happen if like America doesn't use Facebook and stuff to do that, but 
China does ban a lot of our stuff uh, over there. So I think uh, I think it's smart. I think I don't think it's stupid. Is what I'm trying to say. I don't think it's like unreasonable yeah. to ban TikTok. Well, Case, what has it really done culturally uh, over the past few years? Yeah, like, make just it just look at yeah, what, <laughs> exactly. I mean, ki- like we have to really assess like where we're at in terms of like kids education and distractibility and um you know what's what's really going on within like that part of our culture like is this promoting good behavior or is it promoting bad behavior i see a lot of challenges and things that that make their way in to uh you know these kids experience and, yeah. and it's coming you've, from TikTok. you've seen the algorithm they okay. use right it's totally different yeah it yeah. Pu- it pushes like promotes like kids with like awards yeah awards. science fair stuff yeah. like yeah yeah ours is like you know i'm a cat now okay yeah. so this like, is I put shit. nyquil on chicken and i yeah. cook it okay please, so this please. is this is how this is how my brain works when i hear news and see something like that i care less i guess about the, the the political ramifications or what's what the game that that they're playing what i see is that okay TikTok has exploded as far as the amount of attention and traffic and people that are on it in comparison to almost all of their social yeah. i mean it came out of nowhere and is now like leading the way yeah. So if if the government comes in and regulates and shuts that down, then that's going to squash that platform and that attention is going to go somewhere. Yeah. So where does it go? Oh, you know, it's interesting what just came out, what, a few weeks ago is when Elon Instagram. took over Twitter, oh, he Vine. announced coming back, bringing back Vine. Yeah. Vine is very similar to the vibe that TikTok has. Wouldn't be hard for him to write code just like that. He's already got a massive following within Twitter. If you lose all the people on TikTok, do not be surprised if everybody comes into Twitter because sure. it now has of its course. feature like TikTok. Look out. Well, it's, they've already proven well, those reels have already been trying to yeah. engineer that with Instagram. But I mean, yeah, it's definitely going to move just like sidestep over to a different platform. They've already proven that there's a market for it. So yeah. it's like, in, did you see what happened in Russia? Well, not what happened, but you know how like all these companies uh, banned serving their products in Russia. Mm-hmm. So what Russian companies did is copy them. So there's like Coke knockoffs and stuff like that yeah, yeah. in Russia because there's a market. Yeah, People want the the, the the products. We're saying you can't have our products, so they'll make our own. So that's what will happen. TikTok will be gone. Well, but I agree with you. I think you're going to have a social media company that's going to copy it here. Mm-hmm. And that's they'll get the attention. Oh, yeah. And it's a huge opportunity. Isn't it? The, so the difference with it is they promote. They, they really, if you have like a video, they promote it to a bigger uh, pool. So like you, you get like more exposure so, in terms of eyes. Yes. That was okay. The brilliant thing that TikTok did. It's a, you know, it's easy the ultimate to go. attention horror platform. Exactly. So if you are the, the kid who's on Instagram, <laughs> who was on Twitter, who was on Facebook, who was trying to build community, try to get attention, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Twitter, they all make things ch- more challenging, right? Like as we, have, we've been doing this business now for almost nine years if you include the time that we started before we actually started the, the podcast and what have you noticed? Like the algorithm always changing, like yeah. you lose your, you don't, your audience doesn't always see you. There's always like this challenge to like be seen by the same amount of people that you were being seen. You can't just use a the year same ago. strategy all the time. Yeah. The same strategy is always changing. Well, TikTok made it very easy to get seen and, and get and promote your stuff out there. So everybody would look more popular and that was so attractive to these young kids that wanted to be social media stars and famous. Mm-hmm. And so, and then you add in the fact of the shorter attention span of the quick 15 second reels. It makes that were, everybody feel popular like right away. Yes. You know? yeah. Yes. 100%. It's like, oh, you couldn't get that popular on Instagram or Facebook, but hey, you go to, Tw- you go to TikTok and it's a lot quicker to get more views, likes, the way, and follows. People don't realize yeah. I tried to say, oh, I t- so I had a conversation with my kids last night about this. I said, what do you think happens if, you have a video or you do a post that goes viral. And they're like, oh, lots of people see it. I said, yeah, yeah, but does that make you, do you think you can be rich off doing that? And my son, who's older, who's worked for us, he gets, he understands a little bit. He's like, no. He goes, you'd have to f- figure out how to like leverage it and do a bunch of stuff and build a business. My daughter's like, oh, you'd be rich. I'm like, no. And then I had, I said, mm-hmm. did I you show her all your videos? I did. Yeah. <laughs> I said, honey, Google uh, the man who loves walking will walk further and then look and see what happens. So she did it and she's like, oh my God. The man who loves walking will walk further than the man who loves the destination. She goes, you're everywhere, dad. Yeah, like yeah, so yeah. many people are qu- are posting this and quoting YouTube, you. YouTube, Instagram. Yeah. And you go, we went down the Hey, honey, guess how much hilarious. money daddy made from that? Yeah. Zero. <laughs> <laughs>
There's people selling Not a t- goddamn thing. Bro, there's t-shirts and posters being sold. Yeah, there's other people, people are making money off of it. to it. You know, they're just, oh, man, like mind blown. Yeah, my daughter's like, oh, my God, you're everywhere. I've made zero dollars on it. I love it, man. What a waste. Like, it's terrible. It doesn't do anything for you. Yeah. So I don't know why we, people are so excited about it. felt any business from it. I mean, I, I, I think we all at one point fell for that fallacy, right? I think that we all thought that if we got, if you got that much attention and you had a business that you you automatically end up generating revenue, but it just doesn't work that way, you know? No, yeah. it doesn't. There's a lot, there's so many other factors that have to be, you know, factored in or, or considered a part of the formula. You know, it's going to be, so, okay, think about what we've been in the last like 10, 10 years, maybe more, are we 10 to 14 years? How long has the, the, uh, the bull market been? It's been over 10 years, right? Oh yeah, over so we're like fourteen years. Is that's that right? Been at least ten years. That's a not. that's a long that's a long time that we've been on this run. That's we've a milking bubble. While, this yeah. next couple years is really going to expose a lot. A All the lot. holes that were there. A Just lot a lot of, of people. Yeah. Money. Yeah, a lot of a lot of fake money. A lot of lucky people. A lot of lucky people are are going to go broke in the next couple of years because they were lucky. Well, dude, the pan- and it's going to expose the people that actually built dude, legitimate During the pandemic good was a perfect example. Remember that? We had yeah. everything shut down. Yeah. People were like, I'm making millions of dollars selling baseball cards. Oh, I'm selling an NFT. I'm selling a you know, oh my god, you know, crypto. I'm rich and I'm like, oh boy. This is the beginning of the end yeah. when all these people are making money with worthless stuff or super easy and everybody's talking about how easy it is. Now the positive thing is if you built a business on the the same principles that would make a business successful 20 plus years ago, yeah. you're going to be you're going to be You'll fine. You'll be able to ride it out. You're going to yeah. be fine and you're going to rise to the top because you've you've found a way to provide tremendous value and and help people and provide something that people want or need and you even if you weren't super famous or super popular People will still want or need those things, even in hard times. And then you will flush out a lot of the people that were, you know, getting lucky on a lot of talking things. about like businesses that are going to crush or whatever. Generally, I must speak generally here. There's a segment of uh, a segment of medicine. There's a business type in medicine that is going is not only grown, it's going to grow exponentially faster over the next decade. It's literally going to become a huge huge segment of the medical industry and that is uh hormone replacement therapy oh, I- did you see okay so so testosterone levels have been dropping in men for the last six decades just and they've been talking about it for it's bro like, well, I just, i've been listening to scientists uh, alarmists out there that are trying to present that uh to and, and just it, it's been a bit like scary to think bro about. i just saw a study that yeah. our friend mike munsell posted that was done on over a, over a hundred thousand men. So huge. And this right? is over this fifteen is, years. Not even. This is yes, less, this is than, just this the, less than two decades. This is just the last fifteen years. The, bull, the last bull market that we were just talking about. Thirty five percent decline in in men's testosterone across the board. Yeah. Thirty five. That is crazy. So what's going to happen yeah. is testosterone replacement because low testosterone that you can't get to go up to your healthy levels causes lots of health effects, negative health effects. So increase in heart uh, disease risk, dementia, cancer, you feel like shit. It just, it's not good. Just like having low of any other hormone, right? But testosterone is one of the, the main hormones in men. Also in women, it also has some important fact, uh, you know, effects in women, but it's declining. And what I think is going to happen is you're going to see insurance start to really cover this because mm-hmm. it's going to become so ubiquitous. You're going to see so many men have to go on testosterone, especially in their forties. Well, it's crazy. Cause I mean, even when my, my kids were being born, they're talking about like these hormone disrupting chemicals yep. that, that make their way into the womb and like they, and they get passed on. So it's like, it's not just, it doesn't just stop with you and like, like your environmental uh, exposure, like it gets passed on. And then the next generation already starts out with it. Well, there's a fertility crisis that's happening in men and in women. So women's fertility is also uh, in a bit of a crisis. Literally, I was reading this the other day, within the next few decades, if we continue down the same path, we're going to be in a, a major fertility crisis. So fertility clinics have already exploded. That's already exploded over the last 20 years. They're going to continue to explode. Um, and so now with men with hormone replacement therapy, and I think it's going to be you're gonna. It's gonna be a big part of your insurance. Where It'll men be, are gonna go, and they're gonna be like, "Oh, yo, you you, you have low testosterone, just like sixty percent of men." It's yeah. gonna. It's gonna. It's gonna rival the Green Rush. 
It's 100% going to rival the, the medical marijuana industry. I 100% believe that. It looks just the same to me. It reminds everything from the the stigma that was around it at first where everybody was like, oh, that's bad. Oh, yeah. and, and then like then people, more and more like studies coming out mainstream and you're starting to see like the the, the risk of having low versus versus all the health benefits that's when you do have higher testosterone yeah. so as that as that narrative slowly starts to change which we're watching it change right now and then the, and the laws start to loosen up with on these these clinics that they can uh, pop up just like it happened in, in the marijuana yep. space you are going to see it and then you add in something i mean to me you talk about thirty five percent drop off in in men like that. Like, yeah. I mean, you That's don't, the last you don't years. need you don't need marijuana. I mean, so that thing that thing took off just because so many people like it and it has some right. Some, you need some testosterone. Of, you need testosterone. That is that is a that so. It could surpass. It could go crazier. Oh, it's going to. It will. I'm telling you right now because yeah. that's the last 15 years. Before that, it was also declining. This has been observed for the last 60 or 70 years. So it's not like it just started dropping. The fi the the 15 year point that they used as a reference point <laughs> was lower than the previous 15. So it's not like it just started going down. Yeah. So this is a big issue. And by the way, hormone replacement therapy is a, is is a great second option. What you want is naturally good testosterone. Well, levels. so yeah. I mean, we some of the audience knows that <sighs> this is how we've positioned ourselves, right? So we have two two free forums that we have out there. We have the MP Holistic Health, and then we have the MP Hormones. The Holistic Health is obviously the the ideal situation, which is what we we tend to push almost everybody in that direction, yeah, especially if you're young. Get, especially yeah, if get you're to a, the root of the problem, you, we go holistic. That's health. right. You're a young you're a young man. You're suffering from low testosterone. I mean, it tees out all these other potential root causes. Then, if you have to, then you have something like MP Hormones, which is the hormone replacement therapy doctors that we've partnered with that are there to help and support that. I mean, that's literally why we, we set that up. I think we see the writing on the wall. We know where it's going. And, and more and more men, young men, are going to be pushed in this direction to, to figure this out. Yeah. And now what it's opening up to is this whole uh, peptide market where, you know, peptides are, I guess you could classify them as drugs. They're kind of gray market. Um, I definitely wouldn't use them without doctor supervision. Although online, there's all these Would you count, would them. you call, if it's just an amino acid, would you consider So is testosterone. So is growth hormone. When people say that, it's just a chain of amino acids. Like, uh, I mean, uh, you know, that's really oversimplifying. You. Yeah. That's really oversimplifying what they are. So is, I mean, if, if you ate- Testosterone is considered just an uh, amino acid? All I mean, al almost all uh, signalers or, you know, signaling hormones in the body are made up of uh, amino acids. And purely and amino acids or are they amino acids plus? Well, okay. How you organize amino acids I didn't acids realize. So, together? you know, school me on this because my understanding of peptides- Doug, why don't you like, Google this? Put, uh, is is growth hormone a chain of amino acids or is testosterone a chain of amino But they're oversimplifying it. So yeah, I could take a bunch of amino acids. It's not the same thing as if I take a peptide that has actual effects in the body. So they're oversimplifying it. I, mm. I, I, You have to, look, they have real effects in the body. Do not use peptides without doctor supervision because they have such profound effects in the body. Mm -hmm. That means if it's not the right one for you or not your your body's not right for it, it could cause also potential negative effects or it could have positive effects. Anyway, I obviously because we work with uh, doctors, you know, I and I like to experiment with this kind of stuff. They do my blood work and I say, hey, would would this be? What does that say right there, Doug? Protein hormones are made of chains of amino acids. Okay. So Steroid hormone. hormones are derived from lipids. Oh, lipids. My bad. Okay, but antidiuretic hormone is a chain of amino acids. Anyway, my point is that it's just an oversimplification. Well, that's good to know because yeah. I they, you, they do use that quite a bit to oversimplify. Make it sound like- To make it sound like it's no big deal. Yes. Oh, I take branched chain amino acids. No. Why not peptide amino well, acids? Well, so I'll give you an example of one that I'm using right now. So and I so I do my blood test. They check everything out. Then, they'll, then I'll say, hey, uh, I want to try this. What do you think? They'll say, okay, we'll monitor you. So I'm, and I've done this one now a couple of times it's called M MK677 or Arbutamorin. So it's a ghrelin. Isn't, isn't that a government conspiracy? No, you're the MK Ultra. <laughs> MK Ultra, bro. <laughs> you're just, good job, you're taking a government it's conspiracy. It's totally different, uh, yeah, <laughs> program. When, when, Justin, when Justin and I go off, sometimes you listen to it. Uh, no, no, no. This is a- That's it, real, man. This is a, it is. It's a real thing. Look it up. MK Ultra. Uh, so it's a it's a ghrelin mimic. So ghrelin is a hormone stimulates uh, appetite, but it also, when you agonize the ghrelin receptor, makes your body produce a lot more growth hormone and, and IGF one, right? So uh, MK six seven seven or or ibutamorum, you take it orally, so it's got a high uh, affinity orally, so you don't have to inject it or anything, and 
it raises growth hormone. So you get all the effects of higher growth hormone. That being said, uh, and, I, and I've tried it a few times, and it's a profound muscle builder. It is a very effective, I definitely build muscle on it. I definitely get better pumps. I definitely notice my skin getting, you know, all the effects of growth hormone. However, because it's a ghrelin mimic, what, do you ha what happens when you have more ghrelin, Adam? Mm, <laughs> hungry as fuck. Mm. Appetite. Hanger. Yeah. Bro, it's wild. Yeah, yeah. It's, my, I, I mean, yeah. like day two and my appetite is like through the roof. And so I'm like, this would be... Is that, is that is that is that what is happening? When, so when I used to take Echopoise, I haven't taken Echopoise in a really long time, but when I used to take Echopoise, I would get this massive surge like that. Is it signaling something to, to raise ground? They don't know why people say that about a steroid like uh, Equipoise. Equip for people that don't know, that's a veterinary uh, drug. You can't use that uh, legally in either way, but people I'm not say- not promoting it, it, by the way, by yeah. saying that. <laughs> yeah, Adam's done some stuff. Yeah, yeah. just but, admitting, okay? Yeah, but uh, no, but I, was always, I was always fascinated by that. No, it's different. So this is an actually mimics ghrelin. So my body thinks I have oh, more wow. ghrelin, so I'm hungrier. But it's it's so so it's funny. It's like wish I had something like that though when I was younger because that was one of the totally the, right? one of the biggest limiting factors for me to grow when I was in my early twenties was I just could not eat enough for the amount I was burning. That's what I was gonna say. So if you're like a hard gainer, it could be a great as long as you qual like it works for you and it's appropriate. It would be a great peptide. It's funny because people are like oh raise growth hormone get leaner, which is true, but I don't necessarily think this one's a great cutting. Peptide because it makes your appetite go so, so I could not cut on this. No way. Would you say then in terms of like, uh, would would uh, these peptides be more of an endogenous producing? So it like works to kind of help your body produce the, this response more so than like an exogenous yeah. like, like hormone that you're injecting yourself. Yes, with. but that doesn't mean, so I want to be like, I, I'm just like to trying careful. to think in terms of like, um, uh, it, would it be a safer option sometimes or, or is that like, or you know, they'll say that it's safer. Some people will say that. Um, I don't, are you I, taking I any peptides right now? I are, was going to experiment with the one that uh, I noticed you looked hella buff lately. I, I thought maybe you were <laughs> fucking around with something. I don't know about you, I think, I, just, it's I think a, it just worked out. Did you see him when he, yeah, he I just got a pump. Dude. I could tell. No, bro. no, 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 no. I saw jacked. you on Halloween, bro. I, Katrina was even making comments. No. My wife starts making comments about your arms and I know something's up. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> usually she's talking like, about what, my arms. dude. I just been more yeah, consistent. It's about Sal. You know? Yeah. Stupid. Like, stop. You're embarrassing me. You're dude. No, no. Yeah. No, the one that, um, 100 percent let's just be on it you've put on at least four or five makes you a little of, yeah of lean sure. body mass yeah did i hit sure. the number and right? he looks yeah. lean his he, yeah. your shoulder separation is what i noticed yeah okay how yeah. uncomfortable Thank is justin you. right now I, he is very I uncomfortable like, yeah. i'm sweating dude <laughs> yeah, everybody look at back. justin <laughs> <laughs> i don't like that kind of no I, I actually had yeah. a chance to compliment you yeah. so are you are so you're Thanks. not you haven't done the peptide thing yet I no, I have. I have. I did the one that. Um, so when we the were sex one, yes. yes. Oh. So we were in we sanctuary. All did the sex one. Yeah, just awesome. Yeah, well, was awesome, but uh, oh, so it it causes nausea if you do like um, too much. Uh, yeah, too much. <laughs> He said that, but I never had any issues. Some I, kept, I didn't. I kept pushing Courtney the limits did, too. He's yeah. like, he's like, oh, only go this much, and I was like, oh, that means don't. You know what it is? It was by a the total way? block. Yeah. Do you got, okay, so it's called PT. Doug, Google this because I'm I'm getting it. PT one four seven. I think it's called. It's anyway. I'm probably getting it wrong. It 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 stimulates the melan uh, melanin receptor. So if you take it, you'll actually your skin will will tar will tan. One of the side effects, especially uh, in women, right. is an increase in libido. That being said, you got to be careful because some people are sensitive to it and they'll get flushing and nausea. So you have to start with a really small dose. Yeah. So I'm assuming you guys took the full dose because yeah. you wanted to go hard. Yeah. And then you paid the price. Tried. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I've had a few of these blocks. I was going to bring up another one. Like, so I had like stomach stuff and I've been fighting my way through. Like, it's just like, oh, PT I get one four one. That's what it's called. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. I get, um, I get, I get like, like real audible noises with the, and, and this is where ducks do like sound checks and then oh, and you'll, you'll hear just like rrr, rrr, rrr. <laughs> like I don't know why like and this has always been the case and I've obviously I've had like in, like stomach gastrointestinal stuff like my whole life I've been fighting apparently and I just ignored it and uh, <laughs> but this is just one of those things I'll lay down and it's always been like the biggest cock block in America <laughs> like it, I'm just sitting there and I'm going to <laughs> lean over and like make kiss, a move and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, shut up, you know, like, you, like you can't stop it either. And yeah. it's like, I, I need to like stand up and, 
you know, it's it, anyways, I just, I, I don't know if anybody else out there is, you know, suffering from like, <laughs> somebody wow, shared a, a TikTok stomachs. with me, a viral TikTok uh, yesterday that was like, uh, like this, like super hot chick and this, the, the boyfriend and he's like tickling her and she farts. <laughs> <laughs> and then like the, ne the next clip is him like giving her her suitcase and a full of clothes, oh. like to leave. <laughs> you know what? That wouldn't stop me. Oh, man. That wouldn't stop me at all. <laughs> if I'm, hey, it's a great video because you don't see no, it coming. It She's like, good. Either. They're like wrestling around. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> Just like hilarious. Yeah. If the ball's rolling, you fart. Like, oh shit. We'll pause, bad. but we're gonna keep going. Uh, That's not gonna stop me. Uh, it's so funny. I could totally see a cartoon being drawn of what happened to Justin. It's like his yeah. penis is like, yeah, dude, we're gonna get oh, some. We're gonna get some. And his stomach's like, watch this. Yeah, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mess this up for you. <laughs> yeah. That's, what, that's what he thinks. That's what he thinks, bro. Uh, you know what you gotta do? It's the worst. Put on some music. You gotta drown it out, bro. Put some music on. Or hey, I, I don't want. I don't want to forget. I know today we have a commercial for Organifi, and I. It. I don't know. I know we're getting ahead right now because the, the baby's coming. So are is the the your is are we calling it a pre workout? Is that what peak we're, power? It's called peak. I power. know. But is it, what are, are you? Would you label it as a? As yes, a, you a, could use it as a pre workout, pre work, pre creative process. Is Anything? it going to be live by now? I, yes. Doug says yes. Oh, it will be. It oh, I can't is wait. amazing. I have put this formula together. I help work on it, I should say. It is great. I'm excited for you. I'm excited for the fact that we have been able to create a supplement and you ne you did not force us into starting a supplement company. Yeah. Well, I know you think yes. that that placated me, <laughs> but it only made things worse. Because now I'm seeing how now good you these products are. Taste of it, right? Uh, yeah. Like, Ooh, this is. I know. I know. When I leave, Adam has a meeting with you guys. Like, listen. I do. I, I gotta get. Like, I run all the numbers by everybody. Let me let me keep you guys clear this. on what Sal wants to do right I now. I know because I'll get Doug excited. Doug likes like supplements yeah. too. So I was yeah. like, hey, better, let's yeah. show them but the numbers. Doug is very much so a numbers guy too. So I squash that real quick. Yeah. Let, me, yeah. let me show you the math on what, what this looks like. Yeah. It's not worth it. Yeah. It's not. But I I'm excited for people to try it. It's uh it's great. I've already I've taken it many many times now. So I love it, man. I freaking love. Are we? Yeah. I mean, I'm. I'm like. Are we going to get a shipment? We. I would imagine we should get a shipment. Yeah, they're going to give us more. Okay. Yeah, so my bad. Hopefully, by time. <laughs> yeah. No, I. I, I got. I mean, I got to try it the first time. Yeah. We, but I don't know if that was the final formulation or not. Yep. But I'm. I'm super pumped. Yeah, you take. You could take. You'll probably like two or three dots uh, times the, the. I really think that was clever and smart how you did that. Where mm -hmm. you, uh, you, to where you have that option to control low that. dose or high dose. Yeah, because yeah. most pre workouts, it's like maybe one or you could do one or double. That's it. But they don't make it to where you can kind of scale up that way. I'm not trying to, sensitive in different amounts. And right? I'm not trying so. to encourage like people to have this down regulation of receptors for stimulants and CNS issues. Like, yeah. I like pre workout type stuff but i also like healthy being healthy and not having like negative effects so it's like mm -hmm. let's balance that out you know that was the idea speaking of <laughs> of drugs when's the last time you guys have taken like full strength nyquil do you guys remember the last time oh, you've taken I'm a, that i'm a big uh, nyquil fan it's been a long time but oh, it bro. it knocks you out bro. oh it's a, it's one of the things that we so, keep we, that's all on the regular i'm sure the audience if we get sick I, that nyquil is like one, i i think nyquil even it's, it's like, like the full-on reset button right you if just, i'm boom. sick and i'm just that's like put the one thing that will actually put me out really well dude so you can hear my voice i have like this kind of, kind of mild cold or whatever so i took it yeah. last night i haven't Sultry. taken i haven't taken nyquil in probably 10 years so i'm like you know what oh, i need good sleep tonight yeah I'm just gonna do Nyquil. I'm what is it that's it. in there? That's so there's an antihistamine. There's Don't an antihistamine. Meth in there. out of it? No. Oh, no, no, that's uh, Sudafed. 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 That's Sudafed. Yeah. <laughs> Adam and I know right away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I heard. Listen, I hear, you guys. Hear. Yeah. <laughs> Adam can't yeah. buy it now. By the way, well, yeah. I just saw it was locked up. It takes so like, like 14 boxes up? though, just to make like a hit. So it's not. Oh wow! Thanks, Adam. Just kidding. I have no idea. Anyway, so I you need gasoline. So I took it. I took a full dose, and bro, that's. Fucking nasty. Like, so what is it? You, what, what is there's it? an antihistamine in there that's got really really strong sedative. Which properties. is okay. Which is, antihistamine would be the same thing that's in like Benadryl. Yeah. So you know how Benadryl makes you sleepy. Yeah, it makes mm -hmm. you drowsy. It's like that, but stronger. Oh. So I took it and I'm sitting there and I'm like, all of a sudden I'm like, Burr. yeah. I'm like, oh shit! I went upstairs and I'm like, oh my, good night. Eight o'clock. Out. Yeah. Went to sleep. Eight o'clock. That was it. Woke up and like like crust him up. Are you so <laughs> Where are you, am when I? you when you get sick, are you uh are you the type to still try and do everything as holistically as possible before you take like a, a, a drug like that, you know, before you were to take oh, something? I do it all, bro. Listen, I'm not I don't discriminate. Yeah, it's exactly I go like holistic I, yeah. and the drug stuff. Yeah, and no, you know what it is? It all. I weigh it out. So because one thing about NyQuil, it's got acetaminophen, which uh -huh. depletes glutathione in the liver. Uh and you don't want low glutathione when you're fighting a virus. Okay, so it's important if you take acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, or it's found in NyQuil, to also supplement with something like NAC 
or glutathione to offset that depletion. Otherwise, what could end up happening is you could actually make it so that you're, it's harder for your body to fight the virus. So I do all that. And I also weigh this out. Okay, I'm going to take this pharmaceutical. So what's the the risks or the, the the downsides of taking the pharmaceutical versus the downsides of me getting poor sleep? And at this point, I'm like, the good sleep outweighs me taking this, this drug or whatever. And it's not like it's ideal sleep. It's knocked out sleep. It's not like natural good sleep. Yeah. But I needed it, man. I needed it. So I took it and uh, I'm, that was it. I'm determined to see what happens this winter because I'm, I'm on my cold plunge kick right now. And w the, you're now the third person in the last month that I've been around that's sick that I, I you know, knock on wood, have not caught it yet, which is yeah. kind of unheard of I've for me. a bunch of people around me just bleh, so yeah, often. Could, so, so far, so good. Yeah. yeah. I, I swear that makes sense. And I kissed you on the mouth the other day. You got nothing, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't your tongue this Dude, time, speaking so. of sleep, speaking of sleep, you want to hear some shit on sleep, like how important it is? We all know how important it is, but check this out. People who reported getting five hours of sleep at the age of 50 were 20% more likely to have been diagnosed with a chronic disease and 40% more likely to be diagnosed with two or more chronic diseases over 25 mm -hmm. years compared to people who sleep up to seven hours. Additionally, sleeping for five hours at the age of 50, 60, and 70 was linked to a 30 to 40% increased risk of multi-morbidity when compared to those who slept for seven hours. Researchers also found that sleep duration of five hours or less at age 50 was associated with a 25% increased risk of mortality over the 25 years of follow-up. So it's like, boy, you want to kill yourself? Like, just get bad sleep <laughs> yeah. all the time. Just don't sleep. Holy uh, cow. It happens quickly. That is that terrible. Point. Yeah, we talk about how, what. so what are the biggest culprits? Like, obviously, stress. Uh, we know that the tech at night. Alcohol. How bad alcohol. is it? Like, isn't alcohol one of the worst things that you could have, like, right Hold before bed? Yeah, I, I don't know. And like, metabolism-wise, like, I always feel so hot. Like, if I've had been drinking, <laughs> and, like, I sweat, and it wakes me up, like, way, way more so if I've been drinking. Is there, do you guys, I, I don't know this because I'm not a big drinker. Is it? It, um, like one drink is all it takes to disrupt that, or is it yep. like? And is it as the more you drink, the worse it gets, or is yes. it on a spectrum? Yes, both. Like? Okay, well, explain. So, one just one alcoholic beverage re uh, reduces the quality of your sleep. Just one. Mm -hmm. By okay. A, but I, okay, by how much? Oh, that's a good question. Like a, Maybe Doug could look it up. Yeah, because I, I thought I heard that like just one, even one drink. Because I, I used to have clients, right? I would try and explain like, oh, and they'd be like, oh, I just have one glass of wine. And if I rem if I recall, I remember looking that up. That even one glass of wine like dramatically yep. disrupts sleep. And yeah. of course, yeah, if you have ten, it gets even worse. See, but it's get, actually pretty high just for even one. So people get fooled with alcohol because it knocks them out. Yeah. So they think, oh, I'm I'm actually getting good sleep. When in reality, it's not. It's terrible sleep. Yeah. What does that say? Moderate random. amounts of alcohol, so two servings per day or one serving per day for women, decrease sleep quality by twenty four yeah, by a quarter. That's High amounts of alcohol, which is more than two servings per day for men. That's right. See, 39. That's exactly what I read. Was it, It's like it was, wow. it, you already, Wait, by two, having <laughs> one drink, one to two drinks, you're going to disrupt it by a quarter. You having 10 is only 39. It's not that big now, of a difference. Now, That's how the, it did the, the acetaldehyde that ends up, because what happens when you drink alcohol is the metabolism of alcohol releases acetaldehyde. And your liver does a good job of breaking it down, but some of it gets released before the alcohol gets to your liver. So that goes into your bloodstream and acetaldehyde causes all kinds of nasty shit, right? It can make people feel irritable, it hangover. Havoc on you, yeah. It can make them just, it makes your, it can make your sleep shitty. It can fuck with your gut health. Uh, so like the company we work with Z-Biotics, it, it's a, it's a great, if you're going to drink before bed, something like that should make a big difference because it breaks down. It's literally probiotics that are modified. They're genetically modified to break down acetaldehyde in the gut. So at least you won't get that gut release of acetaldehyde like you would yeah, normally. Hey, check this out. There's a company called LMNT. They make an electrolyte powder you put in your water that has the right amount of sodium. Okay, so most of them don't have enough sodium. This has the right amount of sodium to give you better pumps in your workout, better performance, better endurance, no artificial flavors. It tastes good. It's amazing. No sugar, no calories. Go check this company out. Go to drinklmnt.com forward slash mind pump. And by the way, you can get a free sample pack with any order. That's eight single serving packs for free with any LMNT order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Aaron from Indiana. Aaron, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Um, so as you know, I'm Aaron Parr. I'm 18 and a uh, freshman in college. Uh, I run track and I've been lifting consistently for about two years or so. Uh, I'm 5'8". Five nine on a good day. Um, 
at about 180 pounds. But on the question, I've been having a reoccurring problem with my hamstrings. And uh, I'm starting to wonder if it's due to my genetically short insertions of them. Uh, does genetic size uh, or length of the muscle play a role in injury? No, not really. Are you now? Okay. So tell, tell me more about the problem that you have with the hamstring. Um, well, I've pulled my left hamstring like three times now. Um, my right one once, and it usually only happens, um, when I'm sprinting, like lifting doesn't bother it much at all. Um, in any range of motion, I try and work on like RDLs and like strength in the stretched position. And then the lifts and I don't know, it just only happens when I'm sprinting. Yeah. So are you a sprinter? Is that what you do track and field? Yeah. hundred and two hundred. Okay. So sh short or long muscle insertions, um, probably plays no role or if there is a role in injury, it's, it's super minimal. Um, what, what's happening is you just have an imbalance that's, and it's very common. That's a common injury yeah, very uh, with common. sprinters. Quads, quads are super do dominant and then the hamstrings aren't as strong and can't keep up with the quads as they pedal you through like a sprint. Yeah. It, but you know, there's more to that, right? It's not just that your hamstrings aren't strong. It's the kind of strength that you need from the hamstrings because sprinting is not the same. Uh, although heavy lifting like RDLs, single leg deadlifts, leg curls, that kind of stuff will strengthen the hamstrings. It's not work. It's and there's some carryover to explosive power. You're pulling your hamstring when you when you're trying to express your strength through speed, right? It's that explosive uh, power. Like right now, like I never sprint, right? I never run. I never sprint. I lift weights all the time. Have strong legs. But if I were to go try to sprint right now. You would pull him. My risk, a lot of yeah. force demand, yeah. My risk of injuries would be kind of high because I don't train that way. So, what you're gonna what you're gonna want to do first off is make sure you have you don't have any real strength imbalances. So I would work on things like lateral stability, single leg exercises when you're doing your strength training. So single leg deadlifts, uh, you know, lateral lunges. Um, you could do uh, you could drive the sled that kind of stuff. But then I would do reactive exercises where you're jumping off a box, landing properly, jumping on a box, plyos, you're training different different mm -hmm. planes of movement and do it in a, in, a, in a controlled fashion so that you can get that, your muscle to be able to contract quickly, but in a safe way. Because it's this is really like a strength skill <coughs> issue uh, that's 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 happening here. Aaron, is the, are those hubcaps on your wall? Uh, yeah, they are. <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you explain that? Did you steal those? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just love working on cars okay. and then we had some left over and then I kind of just put them up there. Oh, cool. <laughs> well, that's cool. Do you do any multi-planar type of a training, especially explosive training like Sal was describing? Have you done that? Not, not really. Um, I'm doing, I just got off, uh, like a hypertrophy month doing high reps and then I tried doing low rest for the first time and it was, it was great, but I don't really do anything like box jumps or anything like that. Maps performance. I really yeah. need to work on maps performance. That's exactly where I'm going, Adam. Yeah, yeah. I, honestly, because if you haven't uh, put any effort and emphasis in that direction, just because there's just so many different factors that your body has to account for uh, when, let's say, like surface is an issue. Let's say, like, depending on what... Uh, what the response is in terms of stabilizing your body so you can, um, you know, maximize your, your run straight ahead. Um, if you start expressing yourself in different planes laterally and with rotation, um, you're going to find that it's going to be much more secure, which then is going to be able to allow your body to perform at a higher level and also avoid injury that way. So I think it's, it's really like put a lot of emphasis going in that direction, uh, here going forward. Yeah, Doug, hook them up with maps performance. That'd be perfect. After that, I would go map symmetry, by the way. Um, so you, maps performance would be ideal. But, you know, um, athletic endeavors, there's a lot of skill involved and there's a lot of, you know, you can have general strength, which has lots of carryover. But what we're talking about is reactive. Uh, it's explosive. And if you don't train that specifically, you can develop some imbalances and issues and, and these can become a problem. So, are the hamstrings too weak? Is that why you're you're pulling them? Yes, but that's not the that's not the whole story, right? Because we could get your hamstrings really strong in the gym with traditional strength training exercises, yeah, it's a different type of strength, and it's and it might help a little bit, but it might it's probably not going to fix the problem. That's probably what you're noticing. It's like I train my hamstrings in the gym. What the hell's going on? Well, but, and also too, I mean, you you may be so explosive going forward that uh, you know slowing down is the issue in terms of decelerating. So, and that you know would put a lot more emphasis on the hamstrings in that regard. So, there's a multitude of factors to this. And then uh, also your warm up. Are you doing a dynamic like dynamic type warm up? What does your warm up look like? 
Yeah, I've started to um, just trying to stay away from injury as much as I can. It's mostly dynamic stuff, uh, a little a little bit of stretching, but I'd, mostly just dynamic stretching. I'd, uh, I'd be interested too to see what your programming looks as far as how how much time you're spending doing like hypertrophy type of training and like overall strength training versus like more uh, you know athletic training. Because if you're sprinting and you're an athlete. Um, the amount of time that I'm spending, like lifting, like a bodybuilder and trying to build a lot of strength, minimal. Is, is very minimal. Mm -hmm. So that, keep that in mind, and that could be another reason why you're feeling like it's back to like Sal's point, and I'm the same way too. I have very strong hamstrings, if, but if I were to go out and try and sprint right now, because I don't train that way, I almost certainly would pull a hamstring. So you may be starting to get real, uh, real strong in the gym, but that's not that doesn't carry over to sprinting on the on the field, so or on the track. So I would, I would, I mean, what do you guys think as far as, okay, so if he were to go performance, then you say symmetry, Sal, and then when he's, when he's actually sprinting a lot, what type of protocol, like strength training, would you have him in the gym? Like which one of our programs would he be running? Like a MAPS 15 type of deal or like a cardio program where it's mostly centered around You know, I, I like MAPS 15. It, really, it's going to be, you know, if you're doing the, dy the, the dynamic exercises, you're training explosivity your ability to react, uh, you know, counter force, things like counter rotation, slowing down, that kind of stuff. Um, Which then, is all in performance. Yeah. And then strength training, the actual, like when you're going to the gym, lift weights, it's like once a week mm -hmm. because you're going to be training on the track and, you know, that kind of stuff, probably three or four days a week. So one day a week of strength training would be plenty. Uh, but what you're running into right now is you're, you're, you're getting that, that kind of, you know, hypertrophy, slow grinding strength. And then you're going and you're trying to sprint quite a bit. And you might actually be increasing your risk of injury because you're generating more power, but you don't have as right. much control, right? So, it, you know, it'd be like making a car engine way more powerful, but not working on um, any of the stabilizers in the car. You're not working on the the shocks and the suspension and the, and the tires. So you got like a thousand horsepower engine and then you hit the, you hit the gas and you twist your frame. You know what I mean? So yeah, that um, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, I using a car analogy cause I know you like cars, so I hope that makes sense. So, so, so think of it that way, right? There's like, you can only add so much horsepower to your car before it, it breaks apart and you have to really reinforce it and do other things. Well, that's kind of what's happening with your body right now. All right, cool. Thank you so much. You got it, man. We'll send over performance uh, for you. Cool. You got Thank it. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. I get the, I get the sense that he's, uh, you know, he's a young, young kid, right? Fresh freshman yeah. in college trying to kind of bodybuild, but then also play yep. his sport. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's what it sounds like to me. And so, and what he's getting right now is it's, they're different types of strength. So I think he needs to, to probably lay off trying to, I mean, look, anybody who, who like just lift weights, just lifts weights has done this when they go to the park and throw mm -hmm. a Frisbee for 10 minutes <laughs> or a baseball, you know yeah. what I mean? Or, and you're or like, tried wee boxing and all of a sudden, you yeah, know, you're like, hurt themselves. Well, oh, I'm so strong at the gym. Why is my shoulder messed up after I threw the Frisbee four times? Right. You know? It's totally different. It's a skill. And, uh, sometimes getting really strong, and then never doing anything explosive and then trying to do something explosive. It actually makes your, your risk of injury. No, it's, I brought that up not that risk. long ago on the podcast. I think that you are at a higher risk than someone who's completely deconditioned, which sounds crazy, right? The guy who does get all this force. Well, you yeah, know. you apply more force. So it, 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 it definitely puts and applies more pressure to that. Uh, joint. But your car analogy is perfect. It's just like giving somebody who's never drag raced in their life before a thousand horsepower vehicle that's not aligned and, and, yeah. and, and expecting them to, to control that versus somebody who's never really driven before but has like a 200 horsepower car. They're going to have a lot easier time handling that. The likelihood of them getting injured or breaking down. Is oh, what, what a great what a great analogy. That's right. true. Take yeah. a 16 year old driver and be like, here's your first car. It's yeah. a thousand horsepower, <laughs> you know, 68 Chevelle or whatever. Yeah, have yeah. fun like they're going to get a car accident. Right, right. Yeah. Versus yeah. them never trained or never ever driven before and then giving them a 200 horsepower car, less yeah. likely to, yeah, yeah, to, very to good. crash. Our next caller is Robert from Illinois. Robert, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Uh, hey, guys. How you doing? Nice to see you again. Uh, I guess I gave you the background last time I was on here, so uh, just give you a little refresher. Um, I'm, I'm a power lifter. I lift heavy. been lifting heavy for about 14 years now, and I've... Uh, Recently, been getting a lot of hand, hand weakness, like golfer's elbow, tennis elbow. Uh, you know, I can lift 1,500 pounds total between my three lifts, but anymore, I'm barely doing 1,000 because I my hands are just so weak. And I was talking to a lot of my baseball player friends, and they all swear by rice bucket training. 
I've kind of heard of it before, but when I Google you guys, because every time I Google something health and fitness, I put mind pump at the end of it because you guys are kind of the know all be all to me at least. And uh, can't really find anything on it. So I didn't know if you guys thought that was a good thing. And if it is, how would you go about it? Yeah, no, great question. So um, I'll talk, let me talk generally about the rice bucket type training and then I'll be more specific for you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rice, rice bucket training is a great way to train different ranges of motion, articulate movement through resistance, right? So for people who don't know, you, you fill up a bucket full of rice, you stick your hand inside of it, and then you open and close your hand and you move your wrist and you can move it in any direction. And the rice- You grip the rice, you squeeze it. Yeah. So there's lots of different isometric holds you can make out of that. Yeah. And it, it produces resistance, right? So you end up strengthening your hands now. So it's a good, it's a great way- to strengthen the hands, the fingers, and the wrist. Now, for you, I don't think the issue is that you need more training on your hands. I think you're because of the heavy lifting that you're doing, you're probably getting inflammation at the insertion points. That's where you sit, you know, that's where you get the golfer's elbow, tennis elbow type of deal. You'll yes. probably you'll probably benefit from really deep tissue massage on your forearms. So I had this exact same problem when I was doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I was doing a lot of deadlifting. It got to the point where my at my elbows were just so painful. It would take me 15 minutes to warm up. And then afterwards, they were just throbbing. Well, I had a really good body work specialist just hammer the shit out of my forearms a couple times. And it literally solved the problem. So, okay. yeah. So, I, I, I think really good deep tissue work is probably going to help. And then backing off a little bit during that period of time to let your, your hands and your forearms kind of recover. Because they sound to me like they're a little overworked. Yeah, I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna add I'm gonna add a little bit to that because uh, this is an area that I've had a problem with um, a lot, and I have a massage therapist for a wife, and she would totally give me relief, like Sal was saying, when I'd get this. But then it just keep happening, so I was constantly mm -hmm. I'd go do a heavy deadlift session, and then the next day she'd be digging into my elbow, and and that would be the only way I'd feel this relief until I started to address my wrists and shoulder mobility. What I find is when I get really strong deadlifting and shoulder pressing and bench pressing, and I'm doing these like the big lifts, but I'm doing nothing right. dynamic. I'm not doing any mm -hmm. mobility or rotational stuff. That's where this starts to come up. And so I'm going to have Doug send you Maps Prime Pro. In there, we have uh, uh, wrist cars. Mm -hmm. Wrist cars and then the shoulder cars are two things that you should prime before every time you're about to lift. And I think that will make a world of a difference. I would also recommend like Zotman curls. I'm pretty sure we also have a YouTube video around that just to just to strengthen mm -hmm. the form centers. Yep. To Sal's point, I agree. You don't need a bunch more strengthening because you're probably doing a lot of it. But I definitely would would implement those in there just to keep the uh, forearm extenders getting strong because I feel like when you get really really strong at those big lifts and you're not addressing any rotational stuff, that's where this problem occurs. At least that's what it was for me. And until I did that, I didn't I didn't fix the problem. I'd constantly have Katrina having to massage. I'm glad my elbow. you said that, Adam, because the, the the massage definitely will will make the pain go away, make them feel better. But then if you don't address what Adam's saying, which is mm -hmm. the root cause. Then it'll just pop back. But yeah, if you find a really good body work specialist who will who's willing to spend forty five minutes to an hour just on your forearms, um, I think you'll get a lot of relief uh, from doing that. But then, yeah, what Adam said, absolutely. I'm glad he added that because without doing that, then what you'll end up you might get caught in a cycle of constantly needing to have somebody work on your forearms. <laughs> you know, you know how up. I found this. So I I tease if you've listened to the podcast long enough, I I've teased Katrina about how she used to massage me all the time, and she I don't get this many massages since we've had a son. And, I'm just saying, yeah, and so when we, when we first start, we first get together and I was lifted hella heavy, like literally she would rub me every night. And so I'd come to, Oh, the elbow and she, and I'd feel better than go out again. And she no longer was doing that anymore. So I had to figure out what the fuck was going on. <laughs> so I was forced to, to find the root the cause. Training wheels. It thing. was, yeah, it was working fine when I had a, a massage therapist sleeping next to me who was rubbing me every night. I was, it was like, all right, it's cool. Broke, it's fixed, but broke, it's fixed. But uh, eventually I had to get to the root cause, which it absolutely was the, the wrist cars and shoulder mobility for me. And then that totally eliminated it, but I have to stay on it. Right. Cause I get lazy just, you know, being, being honest, like I, I feel good. And then I stop doing it. Then I get, <clears throat> get caught up in, in progressing the weight on the deadlift. And then sure as shit, you know, after a good heavy session, then it starts popping up again. Have you well, taken funny you said about your wife and the massage therapist? Cause my wife's actually a massage therapist <laughs> and uh, oh, we go. have a seven month old son. <laughs> uh, so our, our first one, and the other day I was like, Hey, do you care to massage my forearms? And 
I'll tell you what, I made noises that I never knew that I could make because <laughs> of like the pain. I never had it before. Yeah. And she's like, well, you just need to sit there and take it. You're this big, strong guy, and you can't even take a little girl just rubbing her hands on you. And I'm just like, hey, I'll give you a massage. She's like, you ain't giving me a massage because we know where that goes. But a follow-up question other than that. Uh, so I, I do have Prime Pro. I got that a few years ago, oh, and okay. I, I do use the wrist things a little bit. I have been doing it more would you suggest doing that before my workout yes yeah yes yeah, definitely. yes and after too but definitely before definitely before but even after i've been like, doing them on my days off recently yeah. you know so would that be like a good i you, know you guys do you, other priming things you should, like the handcuffs it should and, be part it should be part of your routine if you're getting ready to go heavy deadlift the part of getting ready to heavy deadlift is you getting down and doing your wrist cars you just need to that needs to be part of okay. the ritual every time you deadlift for sure and then in addition to that if you're in your living room you're watching tv you guys are hanging out get on the floor do them some more like you, you can't do enough of them in in your situation but absolutely it's a must before you yeah. go deadlift when's the last time you stopped um powerlifting and and just focused like for a cycle doing unilateral training uh well last time i was on here you guys gave me symmetry which i appreciate by the way <laughs> i'm about to, i'm about to finish it i'm about following to finish up, up with you dude robert you're not I'm getting doing. anything else till you Come fucking on, follow it dude that, and i'm gonna do the symmetry but you're you're right i i it's an ego thing man i've been doing it I had a when I was in Afghanistan back in 2010, when I first started lifting, I uh, was with a uh, sergeant of mine from Columbus, Ohio, and he worked out at Westside Barbell. I mean, he was a jack, the biggest dude I've ever seen in my life. So, you know, he got me into the whole, you know, lift as heavy as you can and just, you know, Louis Simmons type stuff, just rah, rah, all the time. So you're right. I mean, I haven't, I, I, I never have, to be honest with you, Justin, never. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I challenge you. Well, yeah. We're taking back map symmetry and then I'm going to, I'm going to give it to you again. Yeah. Make sure you follow it. Okay. And I'm all for heavy lifting. Don't get me wrong. We're going to pull it out of your library. If you don't use it, we can tell if you opened it by the way. So we're going to check now. Yeah. Roger that. Roger that. Yeah. I will, uh, I will definitely, like I said, I plan on doing it this next go around and, uh, We'll, we'll see what happens. I'll definitely keep you guys updated on it. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, I've been watching you guys for five plus years now. So, uh, right a quick, one more quick question and not nothing to do with fitness. Uh, Justin, I see you wear a lot of St. Louis Cardinals hats. Uh, are you, are you a Cardinals fan? You know, I, I get that sometimes. It's actually my high school. It's uh, San Lorenzo Valley. So, uh, you know, oh, okay. I would uh, say we're, we're, we're in Cardinal country here. So every time I see that, I'm like, yeah, man, yeah. I even got you guys out there in North. Since Cali, I wear it so much, I just kind of like, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm a loose fan now. So there you go. All, I ain't mad at it, brother. I ain't mad at it. Well, hey guys, I appreciate the advice and the knowledge and just thanks keep doing your thing, man. You take got it, easy, thanks, take Robert. it easy, Robert. No, I take I. Yeah. Yeah, you know, guys guys and girls that lift a lot that develop these issues, it's usually like you gotta take a break and then work on the other stuff. But. Shame on him too. He knows, dude. <laughs> he like knows, fucking and, and we're, I don't and, even remember giving him that. Yeah, program. I know. I remember him now. Okay. Oh, I remember yeah, him. Yeah. I remember him now too. And I'm like, you know, it's so funny. That's we already funny. Give, we already given him all the stuff that he needs. You know what I'm saying? He just gotta do it. It's like yeah. he <laughs> called in to get reminded again, bro. Yeah, basically. <laughs> hey guys, you just want to talk <laughs> Hang out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a nice little check in, I yeah. guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's true. You know, those those elbow issues with consistent heavy lifters. It's just your 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 forms are inflamed and overtrained i was stubborn about and it forever. so was i yeah i had to like way back off and how oh, funny it went is it? Away. he has a massage therapist for a wife too because that know. was like my like when i was when i was bodybuilding it, this was a constant problem because i was lifting heavy and training so much but katrina like kept the band-aid going yeah because i'd come home and i just like i just like this just lay next to her and she just yeah, get into it yeah. for an hour every night and i'd be like oh cool i'm good back at it again but then that stopped and it was like yeah. oh what do I do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what he said about massaging his wife cracked me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want me to massage that's, you where that leads. That's Jessica. She's yeah. like, oh, I'm so sore. I'm like, hey, lay down, honey. I'll give you a... Yeah. Yeah, She's like, why let me handle this. Why my shoulders are sore. like, why your pants So my shoulders are sore. Why are you massaging my, my glutes? Or, yeah. Oh, it's, you know, this is They're really tight. Sometimes your shoulders hurt when your glutes are tight. That's it. I know what I'm doing. It actually <laughs> unlocks everything. <laughs> Our next caller is Scott from Wisconsin. Scott, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, guys. How are you doing today? Good. 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 So, first off, just uh, I know you guys get a lot of macro questions, and I'm sure you're sick of them. So, I just want to say I appreciate my how you guys are, and you can answer these questions for people. I know I'm not special. So, 
um, with that little story, so back in October of 2021, had a pretty life-changing injury at work. At that time, married, four kids. Uh, I weighed about 225, and I just kind of was like lethargic, no energy, something needed to change. So started off the year 2022 with 75 hard, which I just finished listening to an episode on your guys' response on that. <laughs> That's, that could probably be a whole nother podcast. But uh, so, yeah, with that, with 75 hard, like I said, I started at 225. Um, that was that was more to get my mind on track, but I dropped down to 185 by the end of that. Uh, I lost 12 and a half percent body fat. And right now, I'm I'm not sure what my body fat is now, but at that time, I was in a deficit throughout the whole thing, consuming about 1,800 calories, and now I'm maintaining at 2,300 calories, roughly, but uh, I'm not really seeing, so I just bought anabolic, and I'm seeing strength gains, but I'm not really seeing any physical gains, and I'm wondering, like... And I, I count my macros like crazy. So should I stop counting macros and get more on the intuitive eating program and try that? Or Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I think uh, be patient. How, how far into anabolic are you right now? Uh, like three weeks. Yeah, yeah. Be, oh, pa- yeah. Yeah, L- be, listen, be patient, man. You know the saying, where there's smoke, there's fire? Where there's strength gains, the muscle gains follow. So it's pretty reliable. So if you get stronger consistently, you're going to see muscle gains. If you want to speed that up, I would bump your calories. I would just increase the calories by by you know two three hundred calories, mm-hmm. going like a small kind of mild bulk, and that should fuel more of the strength and muscle gains that you're looking for. But if you're getting stronger, you're moving in the right direction, and it's usually this is the way it looks, right? Somebody works out, they have a good you know calorie intake, food looks good, they're working out, they get stronger, 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 boom, muscle. And then again, stronger, 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 boom. It's not, it's almost not like strength and muscle are, they follow the same time or they happen at the same. It's almost like you get stronger for a little while and then boom, the muscle pops on your body. It's almost like it works out that way. And, and I've, I've experienced that myself. I've experienced that with all my clients. Somebody will gain 15 pounds on a lift. You don't see any muscle gain. Then they'll gain another 10 pounds on a lift and then boom, the, they just gain a bunch of muscle in a very short period of time. So, but you know, you can bump the calories, go up two, 300 calories. And continue doing what you're doing. You're moving in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. What are you? I are you doing any cardio, Scott? Uh, no, just on trigger sessions. I walk usually a mile. I walk. Oh, good. Oh, okay. you're good. You're cool. doing great. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I agree with Sal. Add, add a couple hundred calories, and it, it's not that um, I would be against you um, moving towards intuitive eating. I I don't think intuitive eating is the answer to building more muscle. In fact, I think it'd be more difficult to be to have a goal like building more muscle while also intuitive eating. Although the ultimate goal is to get to a place where you intuitively eat. Right now, I would I would keep tracking. You're tracking already. I would add, like Sal said, two three hundred calories and stay the course. I mean, I think that uh, give it some time with anabolic. If you're seeing the strength gains, mm-hmm. I, I think you'll you'll It'll start reveal to reveal itself. Yeah, you I, just I keep going. One hundred percent. I yeah. think you're doing good. And w- after maps anabolic, I think uh, maps strong and symmetry would be good follow ups uh, to what you're doing. Yeah, but you're on the right track, man. You're doing everything right. So, and what Adam said about tracking is is on point. Intuitive eating, you know, when you eventually get to that point, that's a great way to maintain good general health and fitness. But when you're trying to gain or lose, um, then, you know, usually it requires somebody pay attention to, you know, the calories and macros a little bit more. Yeah. It's not going to make it easier. That's for damn sure. Yeah. Like, now, tra- now, if you're stressed out about counting macros, if you called and you said, Hey, I'm counting macros, it's causing me stress. I'm developing a bad relationship with food. Then I'll push you more in the direction of let's start moving you in a more intuitive way. In fact, let me send you our, um, what's our nutrition guide called? Intuitive eating in- guide. Is it intuitive eating guide? Yeah, we have one of those. Okay, I'm going to send that over to you. I wrote it. I can't believe I can't remember <laughs> anyway. I'm going to send that over to you um, because I think that'll help you eventually when you want to move in that in that direction. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Thank you. You got it, man. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, thanks, guys. You got it. Take care. Yeah, you know, uh, that, I'm glad you said that, Adam, because, um, you know, when, you, when you're doing everything right and you're on a good intuitive eating type, you know, regime, you develop balance. Yeah. But then when you want to move outside of quote unquote balance, I want to push my body to gain a few pounds of muscle or I want to add 
10 pounds to my squat or I want to drop 3% body fat. Well, that now you're moving out of what your balance is. And that does often require you to track a little bit and to kind of yeah, pay attention. Be more specific <clears throat> at that point to yeah. achieve those specific goals. It's always been my pushback a little bit when we talk about intuitive eating because I intuitively eat, intuitively eat right now. Yet, if we all got together and said, hey, let's let's try and put on as much muscle as we can as fast as we can, and we had a goal like that, or I had a goal like that personally, I would abs- the very first thing I would do would go track and see where I'm at currently right now. Yeah. And then I would adjust my, my diet accordingly. You know, even though I've been lifting for all these years and tracking food for like, I don't necessarily need to for general health, but if I want to make change in my body, whether it's reducing body fat or building muscle, I want to recalibrate. I'm going to track for a, a period of time to get an idea of where I need to be in order to hit those goals. And then when I hit that goal and I'm like, then I go back to intuitive eating again. So I, I think it's a, I think it's a place that we 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 all want to to Yeah, you, know, you want to be comfortable, you want to be balanced, uh you want to know how to feed your body in a way. And you know, I want to be clear because when we say intuitive people are like what does that mean? Like just instinctually you just have this knowledge. <laughs> just eat when you're hungry. Well, no, it's like look, if you don't know how to swim, uh, you know, you're not going to intuitively swim, you're not a fish. You have to learn the steps. You have to pay attention to what you're doing. And then eventually you can do it much more intuitively. But then if you want to learn a new stroke or you want to get faster, you might have to pay attention to your technique again and perfect certain things before it can become more intuitive. You know, I do it as well, Adam. I don't track everything, but if I'm pushing in one direction or another, I'll track a couple things like, okay, well, let me look where my protein is at because that's most important for me. Or let me see where my my carbohydrates are at because right now I'm trying to you know push my energy when I work out or whatever. So I will track it. But once I get that information, then you have information you can work intuitively off of. Off of. Yeah. It's not this like, we're not born with this knowledge. So I, I want people to, to understand that because yeah, your if, body can deceive you pretty easily. Well, not yeah. just that. If you don't have the information, you don't have the training, you don't have the understanding, then you're just going to base your intuitive eating is based off of your limited knowledge and understanding, which is uh, I know what tastes good. So yeah, let me just yeah, do hunger, that. Exactly. Hunger and cravings. Yeah. And so that's in, now I'm intuitively eating based <laughs> off that. Well, that's going to look like donuts and candy and. You know, I want to I want to address the seventy five hard point that he made too because it's been a while since we we talked about that, and I know we kind of railed on that when it first came out, and and I, I like Andy Versell and some of the stuff that he's he's said or put out there. The problem I think that we we have with something like that is for the general population that doesn't result in what people think it does. And everybody's like, oh my God, I did it. It was amazing because it's like crazy discipline for 75 The fail rate afterwards is is just like any other diet. That's the problem. Yeah. and You lose the weight and you gain it back. And it's such an extreme of- That's one of the reasons why. Yes. And so it tends to promote this on-off behavior that we're always trying to help people solve. And to solve the on-off behavior- doing something super hard and extreme is not the answer for most people. Does that mean there's not somebody who's listening who did it, it changed their life, and now they're like, cool. Yeah, 5%. Yeah. It's the same percentage with any diet. You know what You know what people expect out of doing that, Adam, is they expect an epiphany. Mm-hmm. They say, oh, well, I know the statistics. I know what you're saying, but I think I'm going to do it, and it's going to change my life so much that I'm going to be able to stick to it for the rest of my life. You are not going to solve your fitness and health issues with an epiphany. Those are so rare. Look, I've trained people who've had multiple heart attacks and the epiphany never hit them, right? So don't depend on that. This is a slow process of developing discipline, skill, really developing a good relationship with nutrition and yourself. And so signing up for stuff like this in the short term is great. Yeah, you're going to get to see some results if you stick to it, and the but su- then you're going to fail. And the success rate, it goes up dramatically when you learn to incrementally get add, that's the way add the stuff so all the things that are like that's like people hear me talk about 75 hard and they're like you uh, you not agree with the water thing and the walking thing and challenging no, yourself that's not the point no that's not the point at all i absolutely agree with all that stuff but i also would never take a client who wasn't really doing anything and then throw that at them now my goal would eventually to incorporate all those things over a period of time where I slowly build that into their life. into them. That's right. So that becomes something that they, they maintain for the rest of their life. Not slamming. Anybody can slam something hard for an extended period of time and just muster through it. But again, it, it promotes that on-off behavior. All right. Our next caller is Sebastian from Nova Scotia. Sebastian, what's going on, man? How can we help you? Not too much. How are you guys doing? Good. 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 It's a pleasure to be on here. Uh, start off by saying I really appreciate you guys and have the utmost respect for what you do. Thank you. I've been listening for quite a few years now, and uh, 
know, I relate to you guys in many different ways, especially you, Sal. Uh, we kind of have a similar story, so it's always entertaining to hear your life lessons and your life story, and uh, I really relate to you guys. So some background on myself. I've been uh, working out for around 15 years. I started when I joined the military, served for 10 years, got out in 2019, kind of started with uh, bodybuilding, bro splits, then got into some endurance stuff, cycling, running, swimming. Then I got into CrossFit, powerlifting, but CrossFit led to injury. So then kind of where I am now, I have uh, four kids. So my lifting's about twice a week, full body, try to hit the big lifts. And then once a week, I get out on a mountain bike ride. I would like to do Map Strong. I've been sitting on it. I just haven't had the time to dedicate uh, to do it with the four kids and whatnot. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe Maps Performance will be a better fit. Uh, so that's my plans. But my question for you guys is uh, recently I took a week off working out. Uh, I was feeling kind of beat up and I kind of felt like I needed it. But during that week off, like I felt so crappy. My joints were killing me. My body felt beat. And I was really expecting to feel rested, rejuvenated and just like roaring to go. But I pretty much felt the opposite. And then when I got back into training, I feel great again. So I, I don't know, am I doing something wrong when I'm taking time off training or what's going on there? Yeah. No. Yeah. So um, there's a couple of different ways to take time off. One of them is to do nothing. Okay. Where you're literally just doing nothing. And that's actually less applicable for most people. In other words, most of the time, that's not the best way to take time off. The best way to take time off for most people is to continue to move, continue to do things, but to do them at a much reduced intensity. Because going from exercise to nothing, unless your body really was hammered or you're sick and you need to give your body, uh, you know, just all of its resources to recover. Um, unless that's, the, if, if that's not the case, then going from exercise to nothing can actually be detrimental. Well, especially a guy like this, I can tell just by your background and everything you've done, you like working out, you enjoy it. There's, I, I don't even know you. And I could tell by your background that it's something that you probably really enjoy in your lifestyle. And you, again, probably why you relate to Sal so much, cause he's this guy out of us for sure. That he's a he's a fucking bear if he misses two workouts in a where he's he's worse even if his body needed it rest wise he's annoying to be around super if he annoying. misses two or three workouts <laughs> yeah. because of that that he that's so important case. to him so it makes sense that you, you didn't feel better necessarily by taking a whole week off of doing nothing because you you're the type of guy that likes likes to move likes movement I 100 percent would just bring back the intensity in a week like that I also would add. Because uh, you didn't tell us anything about diet or sleep or anything like that, too. Yeah. So I would have some questions around, you know, how, and, and I know what it's like to have a kid. So having kids, <laughs> uh, you know, how's sleep, how's diet, how's all those things going? Yeah, well, I, I do have a nine-month-old. So uh, sleep is very, in, like I'd say I get maybe eight hours in bed, but it's I'm up all through the night getting her a bottle and whatnot. So sleep is interrupted. And the diet is uh, not as good as it used to be just because, uh, you know, it's a lot of convenience foods on the go now mm -hmm. and uh, not so much time to cook for myself. So I'll do like cottage cheese and stuff to hit my macros. But other than that, it's, you know, I'm out, I'll grab a quick burger or something and stay within my calories. But uh, I also have been in a cut for a while. So I don't know if that would... Uh, it could, you yeah. know, and sometimes too, what happens is people take a week off of exercise and they also take a week off of trying to eat healthy in a particular way or, or do other things for themselves. But I really think taking a week off is, is a good idea, but I would focus on mobility. I'd focus on stretching. I'd go down to 30% of the weight you were using before and just kind of work on full range of motion and just, you got to still move your body. You know, from a, aside from the psychological aspect that Adam was talking about, physiologically, the body generally recovers better through movement than it does through not moving, you know, unless you're an extreme case, right? Unless you'd like, you, you've got, you know, rhabdo where you've just broke everything down and you, you literally need to lay in bed. 
for the most part, if somebody just goes from exercise to nothing, they'll actually notice a decrease in performance. So you you still want to move because it it keeps things, uh, it keeps your body moving in the right direction. It facilitates recovery. You just got to bring the intensity way down. That's the that's the main key. Yeah, it's like a okay. deal. I, I I probably went into it because I was scared not doing anything. I was scared to really eat too much. So I probably cut my calories even uh, more during that week off just to like not put on some fat. You know what? Let me, okay. So I'm glad you said that because this will be, it's a good thing to address. The amount of calories that you were burning with your three workouts was nominal. So cutting your calories to make up for that, all you did is reduce your, your, you, you just reduce the amount of nutrients your body can use yeah, which, to recover. Yeah. So in, the reality is you should have kept your food intake the same. It's not like you were doing three hours of running every single day and then you stopped. You know, you're doing two weight training workouts. That doesn't burn that many calories. One, you know, mountain bike and workout. Okay, that's fine. But divide it over seven days, not that big of a difference. And so what you should what you should do is take another week off, go easy, don't cut your calories, and eat and feed yourself properly, and then see if you feel different. I'm gonna I'm gonna have Doug actually send you Maps 15 too. Um, I think that's good a, call. Someone like you who lifts as much. I mean, Sal and I were talking off air just the other day because he kind of scaled back, and it's like it's a lesson that we continue to learn ourselves. Like sometimes our body's just kind of talking to us and it's, we've been ramping up the intensity and volume and like a routine like that where you're basically doing two lifts a day for 15 to 20 minutes, which is not a lot, is a great way to kind of deload. And you can and you can play with the intensity. So if it's like instead of doing an absolutely complete rest week, you do MAPS 15 and you keep the load moderate and you just you just go through the, the movements for the week and I think you'd, you'd feel pretty good. Yeah. And, and a program like that to me sounds terrifying. Like, <laughs> you know, working out for 15 minutes and that's it. Like that's, that's well, it's every know. day. Yeah. And there's an advanced version in there. That's about yeah. 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, and it's so every day. Yeah. You know, 20, 20 okay. to 25 minutes a day is, is going to be close to what you're doing with your two full body workouts. I think you're going to like it actually. You'll, you'll, yeah. it, you yeah. will like it. I know yeah. you will. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does sound nice with having the family and whatnot. Yeah. Getting in fifteen minutes sounds a lot easier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. give it, give it, a, give it a shot. Give it a shot and see what happens. We're gonna send okay. it to you. I appreciate that. You got it, Sebastian. Thanks for calling in, man. Thank you, guys. You got it. Yeah, uh, you know I can't stress this enough. It's like if you work out really hard one week and then the following week you lay in bed all day and you're like, I'm just gonna lay here and recover. You will come back weaker yeah. uh, with less mobility. What you, what you want to do is you want to continue to move. You just got to reduce the intensity. And that is what helps with the recovery, building, fat loss process. Laying in bed literally tells your body you're sick. And unless that you need, you literally need to lay in bed, that is sending a signal to your body that says uh, a lot of the need wrong to heal. stuff. Yeah. Yes. It's like active recovery requires that blood flow. So it's just, you just have to manage your intensity appropriately. So if you're up high intensity wise, you're up high volume wise, we reduce those a bit. But, you know, that week you're still moving around and, and, um, you know, expressing, expressing your body so that way you can recover. I get it though. I mean, I, I don't, I'm sure you all were in the same boat at totally. one point. I mean, I used to, <laughs> I remember I used to lift. I used like to that. lift yeah, and then go, go sit on lay the on the couch and <laughs> yeah, watch TV. Just, like, like try not to move as much. Drink and drink yeah. a gainer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, let all the muscles grow. Don't yeah. touch them. Yeah. Think about how hard it was then to get back into like ramping it back up. You yeah. know, just your body. Didn't Huge want to do mistake. It. Yeah. Huge mistake. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. And again, they're all free. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can only find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.